OK, I'll start it now. Thanks. Ready to go. Cool. Uh, kia ora everybody and welcome to this meeting of the Cromwell Community Board. Um, I can't, it's always a very strange way to run a meeting when you're sitting in a room by yourself um, speaking into a computer screen where you can't really get a feel for what people are thinking and um, how they're responding and reacting to things. But nevertheless, we will box on and get on with today's meeting. Um, we don't have a public forum item um, for today. Um, so we will go um, straight into our apologies. I have an apology today from um, Verna Murray. So can I have somebody move and second those apolo that apology, please? Can I suggest we probably should consider one for Mr Buchanan, given he is unable to connect? I agree. All right. Um, and so we have a, an apology like from um, Tony Buchanan and from um, Verna Murray for today's meeting. I'll move. Thank you. And a seconder, please. Yeah, I'm, I second. Thanks, Bob. Righty ho. So then we go into the confirmation of the minutes from the last meeting. Um, do I have a mover and a seconder for those as well? Thank you, Cheryl. I'll second. Thank uh, and you. We just, um, uh, just got back joined. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome back. Right. Um, and then we move on to the reminder about the declarations of interest, which is on, sorry, all in favour of the minutes. Apologies, my brain's not quite there yet. Aye. Super, Aye. Thank you. Declarations of interest. Just a reminder for members to stand aside from discussions um, in which there may be a conflict of interest for them. Um, the um, declarations register is attached and um, if there's any changes that you um, need to note, um, then please make sure that we know about those um, now or as we move through the meeting or if you just want to pass those through to Wayne at the conclusion of the meeting if it doesn't have a direct impact for today. And then we need to move on to our reports and we're moving to page 17 to the application to resurvey and increase the easement plan area and we've got Linda joining us for this. Welcome Linda. Good afternoon everybody. Um, so I have three reports uh, for you today and we'll start with an application to resurvey and increase an easement um, area. Um, in um, maybe 2010, um, part of the Sugarloaf um, Reserve, Scenic Reserve vested in council. When it vested, it vested with an easement um, agreement in place um, and that easement agreement um, provided Merv Shaw with the right to locate a bore down on um, the flat and to convey the water and pump it up to his dam above the Sugarloaf Reserve. Um, quite recently, um, Mr Shaw has been working on um, uh, subdividing his property and when they were checking all of the rights and um, easements and other um, factors relating to the land, it was noted that um, some of the infrastructure that was put in in terms of that easement actually sits outside of the um, surveyed easement area. Um, so the recommendation today to legalise that infrastructure that's not contained in the easement area is to have it resurveyed that would allow the um, infrastructure that sits outside of it to be legalised and included in that right. Um, the benefit of that is that we don't need to be digging up um, the reserve again and that um, it will, is the most simplest way and most effective way of um, fixing what is a historic error that the applicant believes that it may have been the um, 
the slope of the land and that the uh, Aurora, when the infrastructure was put in, chose to step it over a bit more to make it actually work uh, better um, rather than it being on the tread of the hill and being un, uh, uneven or unstable. Um, so in the essence of um, safety and the limiting the effect um, or any further effect on the reserve, um, today we are um, recommending that that easement be resurveyed, that that infrastructure be um, legalised and that it be at the cost of the um, applicant. Does anybody have any questions regarding the matter? Madam Chair, I do. Um, thanks, Neil. Um, I note that there is no intention to charge him and on the basis that the original easement would have been done, one would expect, because it was before our time, on some commercial terms. Um, I'm not sure why there'd be a good reason why we wouldn't be doing this on commercial terms as well. Um, we haven't had it valued and because it was a right that was already um, in place when the land vested and because it wasn't the applicants um, doing, um, that it was actually the, the contractor um, who installed the equipment, um, we haven't promoted charging the landowner in this instance. Which I get and understand that, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> that would mean that there's, he's got an easement that he either doesn't need where the, where the cable is meant to be and the infrastructure is meant to be and it's not, or he wants to extend that, um, as to why and how it happened and by whom doesn't matter, it wasn't us. Um, he would have negotiated a commercial term with the previous owner of our land and I would have thought that we should be doing this on the same basis. Um, there wasn't any mention of that and I don't, um, I don't know that the um, owner of the land now was the owner of the land um, then, so I can't, um, I, I don't really have any information relating to that as such. Um, but since then we have allowed um, another two um, parties to um, have easements or they've been granted easements over the same area and we haven't charged either of those parties. So given this is only a, a slight increase in the area of the easement um, plan um, to legalise the exact same infrastructure, um, I'm not sure that it would be fair to start um, going to be a charge for that when we don't charge the people who have actually been granted the same right by council. The logic for not charging those other ones was that we'd already been paid a fee for the easement that's already there because they're going effectively into the same easement area. So that was the logic behind that, that I recall. Um, but at the same time, I um, doesn't really matter who owned it beforehand in my view, um, but that's, that's, that's certainly um, something that I want to explore with my fellow members, but if there's no support for it, then I'll, I'll just crawl back into my corner. Thanks, Neil. Um, anyone else got comment they wish to add to Neil's or to signal their agreement or whether we should go with um, what has been proposed with no charge attached? Um, can I just ask what kind of what kind of charge are we talking? What kind of money are we talking? I can't comment on what the value of that um, might be. Um, we haven't um, had any valuations done um, that uh, would give me anything to base that value on. And I have no idea what it would be either. Any further comment or discussion on that item? Any appetite for sending Linda back to look at what the um, a charge might look like or what the value of the land might be? Or are you happy for us to go back to page 17 and um, look at the recommendations? I'll take that as a let's go back and look at the recommendations. Um, and as they stand at the moment, they are that we receive and accept the level of significance. Agree to the area of the easement corridor on lot 7 DP 433991 being resurveyed and increased in size as shown in figure 6 as one of the attachments to the document to legalise the existing infrastructure and to allow an additional power cable to be installed to meet the applicant's increased power 
requirements. Am I on the right bit? Yeah, page 17 yep. on the page 17, end. sorry. Um, uh, the applicants obtaining all permits and consents associated with installing the additional cable, the applicants paying all costs associated with surveying the infrastructure and their preparation and registration of the revised easement agreement, the chief executive approving the new easement plan and agreement, the chief executive being satisfied with any reinstatement remediation works following any earthworks on the reserve, the consent of the Minister of Conversa Conservation, not conversation, and C authorises the chief executive to do all that's necessary to give effect to the resolution. If you're happy then um, to go ahead with that, not progress um, looking at um, a charge for the land, then do I have a mover and a seconder? Was that you, Tony? No. No? Okay. So this hasn't been moved. I'm happy, need to 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 I'm happy Pardon? to move. I'm happy to move. Thank you. And a seconder, was that Nigel? Yep. Yeah. If Nigel's happy, I'm happy to second that. Thank you, Bob. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Any against? Aye. Do you want that recorded? Please. And Thank only you. for the reason that I think it should be on commercial terms. No other reason. All right. Thank you. Righty ho, and we stay with Linda for our next item, which begins on page 28, which is the proposal to dispose of part of record OT13B slash 860 to Waka Kotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency as agents of the Crown. Linda, back to you. Thank you. Um, so you should all remember that back in um, June 2021, I brought a report for information to the board um, regarding the construction of a roundabout at the intersection of State Highway 8B and um, Ferry Avenue. The purpose of the um, of the report was to advise that Waka Katahi, um, the New Zealand Transport Agency, intended to take uh, approximately 2,960 square metres of the land contained in record of title OT 13B-86, which is um, part of the um, Big Fruit or the land known as the Big Fruit Reserve and on the um, adjacent uh, corner in front of um, Five Stags. Um, <clears throat> we have um, asked uh, Waka Katahi to um, have the land uh, valued and provide us with a more finalised plan. And in doing that, um, they have determined, or, or QV have determined, um, that the value of the land is $184,000. So we are choosing to um, dispose of the land by agreement rather than an absolute taking under the um, uh, Public Works Act, which is something you can do under the Public Works Act. And in fact, they do prefer you to um, try to reach an agreement if possible. Um, in conjunction with building the um, roundabout, uh, Waka Katahi are also going to be occupying the area marked E on page 31 um, for the duration of the construction of footpaths that will um, increase that connectivity um, between the um, mall area and um, a um, underpass, underpass, which I believe is to be built um, to the west of uh, the intersection. Um, the construction of the roundabout is um, the responsibility of Waka Katahi as the um, state highway, um, the National Roading Network managers. Um, and they are responsible for paying that compensation. Um, the recommendation is that we agree to dispose of approximately 2,720 square metres of the land, being two parts, the first marked A and the first marked B in figure two, um, to Waka Kutahi um, as agents of the Crown, uh, in accordance with the provisions of the Work, Public Works Act, for the sum of $184,000 plus GST, if any, 
and it is subject to the income being paid to the Cromwell Property General Account um, and to be held for the purpose of purchasing or enhancing or maintaining land within the Cromwell Ward. So there's a slight difference between this um, taking uh, and the uh, junction of the highways taking, uh, which is uh, reserve land. This land is not reserve land, but we are promoting that it be um, that the proceeds be for the betterment of um, property in the Cromwell area. Um, and that takes us back up to the recommendation. Does anybody have a, any questions relating to that? Can you tell me where the underpass is going to be on that, please, Lynn? No, I don't. Sorry, I don't know where that is to be yet. So this underpass is not going to come out into E? I, ca I, can't, I can't tell you that um, for sure. I don't have that information at the moment, but that is um, my assumption from the plans. Um, I've got a question. Um, I was just wondering, with regard to E and the footpaths, yes. um, are we going to see a plan of where those footpaths are actually going to be placed? And I ask this because, um, and Anna, you might not be, you might be able to help me, help me here. What is the zoning for the school children over in Wintree? Do they go to which which school are they going to be zoned to? Uh, you're on. Yeah. School zones are currently under review, so that's being reviewed by the Ministry of Education at the moment, and the Wooing Tree subdivision is likely to be one of the areas that's discussed as part of that review. Currently, that parcel of land and all the housing that's already exists over on that side of the road um, is zoned for Cromwell Primary. Right. With the underpass being at the west end, if you're talking about safe cycling, safe walking for children to school, then that puts the exit of the underpass into the Crom into the goldfield zone because that's the west side of um, of. Well, that was why I was asking. It would be quite good, would it not, to see where their what their plan is for those uh, footpaths, because the linking to the cycle or the, or the greenways where they can cycle safely, I would have thought was quite important. So mm. we don't really know what their intention is. Um, can I can I just say if you refer yep. to um, the picture on um, page thirty one, um, figure three. Yes. If you if you look under the green area, you can see um, that there are there is a mm. footpath that starts beside the car park area. It's just ever yeah. so um, faint, and then it goes up toward the highway. And at the um, just before the highway, it, it tees off toward Barry Avenue. And, yeah, I've seen um, that. Yes. So that's you that's the footpath. That's the, okay. Yes. So you that's that's their intention. Yes, that's, the, the that's the footpath plan. Mm. That is the footpath plan. So what are all those little wee um, things off the side then? Little white. I, ca I can't answer that. Oh, OK. I, 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 maybe it's um, something to do with the the lay of the land or something that's um, required for mapping out those footpaths. So I, I, I don't know what those bits are, sorry. So it would be safe to assume that that's where the, the underpass comes out. Um, it would be safe to assume, but I don't have that um, as a, 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 an approved plan or any information on that at this time. Okay. I, I wouldn't yeah, and any comment that I've made on school zoning, I don't get to make that decision. That is completely yeah, yeah. up the Ministry of Education, so that may well remain in the Cromwell Primary Zone, in which case where that comes out, that T section will be where students go down to Barry Ave to then go to a crossing to get across the road there, I would imagine. Okay. I wouldn't mind betting that the, those those um, boxes could well be some profiles of some drainage because that track's not going to come out. The underpass isn't going to come out of that footpath at the current ground level. So I wonder if that's a, a gentle um, slope, perhaps. But second guessing, I, I'm what what concerns me is that happy enough to lease the land while they build the footpath, but actually before they build the footpath, I would have thought that's a decision the board should make um, that the footpath's in the right place because we haven't agreed to. Um, our reserve being developed in this way yet um, in relation to the underpass. That's some work that I would expect will still come to us. So I would be interested in there if there's any other staff response in terms of um, happy enough to rent, the, rent the, um, the, the land while they do the footpath. But before they do the footpath, 
the board should approve the footpath and what else goes with it because um, otherwise we're giving Waka Katoa a blank sheet of paper to do what they like on, on our effectively a reserve and I don't think that we're in that position just yet. We should we should get to see what it's going to be. Um, just like we did already when they sent the, the paper that's attached to this report was the was the pre-advice about what land they're going to be taking. Um, and I think that, um, in fact, my, my preference would be to leave the footpath out at this stage and, and get a proper report based on what they're going to do for us to actually approve where the footpath's going to go as well. Yeah, I totally agree with Neil. Mm. Because and, and as, to, as to the school zoning and stuff, that'll take care of itself, and it's not something that we should hold off. <laughs> no, or it's or not something we should. It's not it shouldn't no be part of our decision plan. making. No. Yeah. But in your master plan, that area there was all going to be shops or whatever too, wasn't it? Where that greenway is. Um. So in the master plan, there uh, are some buildings shown um, down in the probably the left hand corner um, of that um, figure three. Um, so that is the piece that is not occupied at, in that sort of um, Barry Ave and uh, Murray Terrace sort of area. OK, so what I'm hearing and um, please correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is that um, people are happy with parcels marked A and B and the um, $184,000, um, um, but not happy to see um, recommendation B2, which um, is around the area marked E on figure three, until we've seen a report that shows us what the pathway system would look like. Yep, that's, that's my view. Yep. Can I come in here? Um, I had a few yeah. concerns actually about that that area. I think that area, um, <clears throat> excuse me, E, where those lines are shown, I think you're right. I think that's a gentle slope down. But it seems to me that that's taking up an awful lot of space in that area there. So I think we need to have a look at the, um, the design for that. And the footpath that's shown going off to the east of that uh, pathway there, um, I had a look at what they're doing there at the moment uh, yesterday and they have actually removed the footpath alongside the road there. Um, I'm hoping that they're going to reinstate that because anyone coming up of that off that um, that footpath there is going to come straight onto the road. I, I presume there's no crossing plan for that area there so that it can link up with the pathway that's on the other side of uh, Barry Avenue. And if you look at that plan and where they've got that current um, eastbound path there, it doesn't even line up with the footpath that's on the other side of the road. So I think somebody needs to have a, a pretty detailed design plan um, on that um, network of, of paths there. Which I think is just the reason why we should leave out a recommendation to at this stage. And um, a further report will come back to the board with the, with the full story because otherwise we're just doing half a job. Exactly. Doing half a job with a roundabout anyway. And the only other question I have been aside, aside because we didn't, that's, that's not something that we can um, influence at this stage, halfway through construction, and couldn't probably have, you know, we certainly had those conversations about um, designs of, of roundabouts, but um, that is outside of our ability to um, do anything other than converse and try and influence. But these things are within our ability to control. So um, what I'm hearing and I've heard from most people around the um, around the screens, apart from Nigel, is that um, we're happy with um, Recommendation B1, but would like more information on B2. So we would take B2 out and we'll look at that again once we see an actual plan for how the that's going to connect with the underpass and the pathways are going to connect across the reserve, the big fruit reserve and into the mall area or onto Barry Ave so that we can see that that will be safe and what that actually looks like. I agree Is that right? 
I agree with the view being put forward by Bob, Neil and Bob. Okay. Can I just, Madam, Madam Chair, I've got one other question though. I agree, that's why I was heading. Yes, but um, Linda has explained why the money should go to the Cromwell Property General Account. My counter view to that is that while this is freehold land, so it's not a reserve under the Reserves Act, it's council freehold land, we treat it as a reserve, and I'm pretty sure that we've spent reserve contribution money on it in the past as we did the redevelopment of it. So I'm just wondering that it would, whether that funding would be more, more relevant to go to the reserves contribution account so we can use it for capital projects um, or other such projects in the in the in the in the in the ward. Um, the only thing about that, and someone from the staff team will clarify, if we were to do that, would that mean that we could only use it for capital projects? Is there someone on the staff team here who's able to answer that question? Um, I think I can. If thanks, Louise. If um, reserve contribution um, funds can only be used for capital expenditure, not for operational. Is there another reserve? Is there another reserve um, bucket other than the general property one, or can we go to the general property account and, and tag it for um, non-capital um, expenditure on reserves? You've just, not matter? you've just surpassed all my knowledge on reserves and funding. Um, but um, what I would say is we could um, we could have a conversation with finance and make sure that um, we'll try and do that now. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not going to die in the ditch about it. It's not the end of the world, but it um, just seems to me that treated as a reserve, it's a, it's a good way to use the funds for that going forward. But um, you know, I'm happy enough the way it is. So if, okay. no, if you no objective, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move A, B, one and C. Perfect. Do I have a seconder for A, B, 1 and C? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So just for clarity, A is that we receive the report and accept the level of significant. B, 1 is dispose of approximately 2,720 square metres of record of title OT13B slash 86 being the parcels marked A and B as identified in Figure 2, to Waka Kotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, as agents of the Crown, in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Act for $184,000 plus GST, if any, subject to the income being paid to the Cromwell Property General Account and held for the purpose of purchasing, enhancing or maintaining land within the Cromwell Ward, and C, authorises the Chief Executive to do all that's necessary to give effect to this resolution. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Thank you. Um, and so the next item that we have begins on page 42 and we get the pleasure of Linda's company yet again um, to look at the proposed road, road stopping for part of Melmore Terrace. Yes, good afternoon again, going for a hat trick. Um, sure are. The the purpose of um, my third report is to consider stopping a part of Melmore Terrace um, in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Act um, and to uh, amalgamate it with uh, the parcel of land that the Cromwell Memorial Hall sits on. This will enable um, the design options and overall development of the land um, for the Cromwell Memorial site to be maximised. Um, so if we um, sort of skip down to um, page 44 and um, figure four, there is an overview of the proposed stopping on that um, in that figure. Um, the proposal is that we stop the 1,640 square metres of um, the road that sits in front of the hall that is actually currently um, occupied as car parking and the entrance and some gardens. Um, for the Memorial Hall, um, the uh, not to stop the footpath that goes along in front of um, that uh, what is effectively an encroachment at this time. Um, and going back up and to the um, to the recommendations, the land um, was valued at uh, five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Um, so we wanted to have that valued up front so we knew um, what the value of it was. And the proposal is that it is 
paid for um, from the Cromwell Memorial Hall and Event Centre project budgets. It, uh, the stopping is subject to the land being amalgamated with record of title 11A 234, which is the Memorial Hall um, parcel of land and that an easement in gross um, in favour of and as approved by Aurora Energy be granted to protect the infrastructure that they have um, through that parcel of road and the final survey plan being approved by the Chief Executive. Does anybody have any questions regarding the proposal? Any questions? Um, this was talked about um, in, in um, our advisory group um, sessions. The parcel of land, as you can see on um, page 43, that we currently have for the hall project has um, some limitations in terms of its size and the shape of the of the piece of land. And the, the thinking behind this proposal is to provide um, more space in order to um, be able to design a building that's going to be include all of the things that a community has told us that they would like to see included in it. So, um, so that's sort of really where that's that's come from. Um, yep. Yeah. So I get that. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, but I'm just wondering until we've actually nailed down the what the hall, what the footprint of the hall building is going to be, we could potentially be buying some car parking here that there's no need for us to buy because it's already a road and you park cars on roads. So just say for argument's sake, the footprint was was currently the hall shape it is now, there's probably a third of that land we don't need because it's already um, a road and you park cars on it. So I'm just wondering if we're just a little bit premature about how much we're going to buy close in terms of the road that we may not need for um, uh, the hall itself it seems silly to me to buy your car park when it's already there. So I'm wondering if we shouldn't just be holding off until we adopt a, a final concept plan of what we're going to build before we determine how much road we want to actually take and pay for. And I suppose part of the problem with that is currently the design brief would be fitting in with the parcel of land that doesn't include that. And so you're limiting the design brief by the parcel of land. Well, no, I don't. I don't. I don't agree. You're not because you d d determine determine your design, what it's going to be, and then take the land that you need. It's not as though there's going to be a barrier to that because it's it's legal road. Um, there's a process to go through. Um, unlikely to be any way of it being stopped from going through a, a process. Um, but I, I guess it's just to me, if a third of that potentially could be car parking, which therefore you don't need to take as a road. Why would you bother paying? Um, you know, what is it? Six? Some? You know, you, you could save yourself one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars here. Louise, do you want to speak to that question that you've asked in the chat, which is, could you approve subject to survey? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wondered whether there was a way of, rather than bringing, if that's where the board lands, then rather than bringing a report back that um, you get as far as the concept plans um, and then survey the level and progress of the road stopping, as opposed to bringing a report back to say the same thing but change the boundaries. Can I so, just say, can sorry, I just no. say it was the designers who brought this um, to us in the first instance because mm -hmm. it was when they were trying to design the footprint that it was um, it actually stopped them because you you can't get a, a building permit obviously for anything that is over on the legal road and they wanted to understand what the full parcel size would be so that they could then know what they were designing to fit. So perhaps if you really didn't want to include the car park um, or all of the car park area perhaps you could maybe square it off in front of the um, or where the car park sort of stops and maybe you could then go with uh, in effect I don't know that's maybe a third a two thirds to one third but as land gets smaller it actually tends to increase in value so you may find that um, there is actually not a lot to be 
saved by shrinking the area of the land which you are um, intending to take. But by taking the lot, you will be maximising the possibility. Isn't there a rule in council that you've got to be so far off a boundary? So that's 12 metres from the edge of the hall to the footpath. So they've got to stick to the rules, don't they? Yes, they certainly have to stick to the rules, but I don't know what the setbacks are on that. I, I, I can't comment on that. Louise will know. Um, yes, if the site's designated for that purpose, you can actually build right up to the boundary. So when we're looking at the concept plans and the existing designation and making an alteration to the designation a bit further down the track so that the whole site can be used. So taking what Linda said a step further, um, all due respect to the designers, but design the hall, design the concept, let us worry about what land we need. Um, they should just be told that, that if you need that road reserve for that much, it's not going to be an issue. Design accordingly. Um, when we get the report where we adopt the, 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 the concept or the design of the hall, I think this report can be included in there in terms of saying this is how much land you need to acquire at the same time. And to me, you package it all together. Um, that's to me seems the best way to do it. We, we, we buy what we need. We don't take what we don't need. Um, and we might also find ourselves otherwise that we take this bit of land and then they say, oh, we want to go a bit further down to the to the right towards Old Cromwell, um, you need some more land down there. So, um, you know, I, I don't see the rush to do this. Um, I just want to say that the land down toward the right um, is not council land, it's Lynn's land. So you would be, um, you wouldn't be able to uh, go with any stopping further that way, for example. OK, what are people's feelings about this? So essentially, Neil, what you're saying is the designers should um, design as if we have purchased um, or stopped um, that as a roadway and not be hindered by the thought that we wouldn't then be able to purchase and get that sorted once we've approved a design. So. So they don't need to be anxious that they've designed something which we will then not approve. But at this point, until we've seen some design work and some concepts that might show us what the encroachment onto that part of the block looks like, we should just let this lie. It's my view. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I've only really heard from Neil and Tony on this one. I agree. I agree with Neil and um, I think that it makes logical sense. Uh, Nigel? Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Neil. Okay. Bob? And so do I, yes, I agree as well. All right. So we're going to let this lie. And our message to the design team is design as if we've approved it um, or not be hindered by the thought that it wouldn't be approved at a later stage if that if the design needs to encroach um, toward the footpath. Um, but that at this point we would be putting the cart before the horse to purchase land that we may not then need um, if the design doesn't use it. That's sort of the essence of it. Yep. Yeah. And I think right. supported by what just happened in the previous agenda item with Waka Katawi, they originally wanted 1,700 square metres and they dropped it back mm. when they finalised their design. Yeah. All right. Does that give you enough direction to go away with, Linda? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Through the okay. chair, I'm. Anna, sorry, Rebecca here. I Hi, Rebecca. think it's probably best practice to just put that in a resolution that the motion lie on the table until okay. such time that the design. I'm making it up. <laughs> no, to be, what about Rebecca to be considered when the final design is considered by the board? Yeah. Okay, so the re resolution 
reads that this report will be left to lie until such time as. Neil, the you board, say it again. The board considers the final design for the hall. Until the board considers the final design for the hall. So can that be read back, please? Bang. Is it the board or is it the group that's doing the, the building of the hall? No, it's the board. We need to approve it. Yeah. Sorry, Wayne, are you there? Mm -mm. Uh -oh. OK, I'm not getting any response from Wayne, so. Sorry, my mic was turned off. Ah. Um, <laughs> I'll try that again. I've said it a couple of times. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, you could repeat that back to us, Wayne. That would be wonderful. Oh, perfect. Uh, sorry about that. Um, agrees to leave the item to lie on the table until such time as the board considers the final design for the hall. OK, I need a mover and a seconder for that resolution, please. Uh, before we do that, should it not say Hall Stroke Event Centre? It can say Hall Stroke Event Centre. OK. I've added Event Centre. Thank you. Well, actually, sorry, if we're going to do that, we probably should get it quite correct. And isn't the wording therefore then? Um, Uh, Cromwell Memorial Hall slash Events Centre project. That's what it's called, yep. Yeah. Okay, shall I read uh, one more time? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> agrees to leave the item to lie on the table until such time as the board considers the final design for the Cromwell Memorial Hall slash event centre project. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Thank you, um, Buck. And a seconder. Second. Thank you, Bob. All in favour? Aye. Anyone against? Thank you, Linda. Um, we move to um, item 22.2.5 on page 50 of your agenda, which is the closing of the Cromwell Hall and um, Gareth, welcome. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Louise here, I'm just going to kick off um, before Gareth presents his report. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As you'll recall, Gareth brought a report to you in July 20. 21 to approve the program of work and the appointments to the project advisory group. Um, I just wanted to say or remind you that that program was developed to get the best balance of timing um, for funding in the LTP, which is very ambitious, and also the right level of community feedback and engagement. Um, and as you know, the, um, there is a stakeholder engagement group set up for that purpose. And also reminding you about the role of the project advisory group, which is there to assist in getting getting that balance as it assures elected member representation um, and also provides regular feedback to the community board. So just I wanted to say that this is a really fine balance, but we're confident that it delivers in, in time and at the, with the appropriate levels of community involvement and elected member representation. Um, Gareth will talk to his report now, but just also pointing out that in his report, he's provided um, updates and decision points for the board and also a workshop to finalise the scope and the costing. So that's just a bit of an overview of where we're at and I'll pass on to Gareth now. So good afternoon. Uh, we're asking the board to consider closing the Cromwell Memorial Hall in the, in the project delivery process. It's shown in phase one, of the project timeline, which is represented by Table The project team and, and the architects need to scrap the project and deliver the concept plans. This will involve investigation of the current state of land in which the hall is erected and whether any potential uh, issues need to be 
uh, resolve before the construction phase starts in early 23. The um, proposed close to date of the Memorial Hall is the 2nd of May 22. This will allow the um, NZEC ceremony to take place. COVID, well, it's, it's all been, the new COVID numbers have all been agreed, so it should take place, no problem. In the hall, um, in an engagement of the hall's current users and give them time to make alternative arrangements for the activities. The date will also give three months to carry out in the asbestos removal um, before the demolition phase, which is planned to occur in July, August of 22. Um, I'll take any questions at this stage. Thank No questions? Okay, carry on um, for us. Please, Gareth. So we're recommending that um, the board receives the report and accepts the level of significance, uh, approves the Cromwell Memorial Hall closure date of 2nd May 22, and pro propose the demolition phase to start on the date of July, August 2022. And approves the community board and the project advisory and engagement and approval process during the project C tables two and three. I now have a question. Yeah, thank Jim. you. Thought you were being hung out the dry, but my microphone was off, so I did a I did a weighing, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I thought there would be questions as we came to the end, but um, um lead us off, Neil. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and, and just making sure we're are reminded about the, the, the pathway that we've established. But the biggest concern I've got here is that we're being asked today to agree to closing the hall and the timeline for its demolition before we know what the new hall is going to look like. And I just don't get that there's any rush to do that no matter what. We are still some way off um, getting the design and the funding and everything else that goes in for a new hall. And um, I think the timelines that I'm hearing are optimistic, quite rightly so, but in all likelihood with all of the other uh, balls that are in the air in relation to things like museums and whatever else as well, um, I think this is, this is um, the wrong time to be considering to close the hall from the 1st of May and agreeing to demolish it in July. I don't think we can make that decision until we have approved a new hall. And if that pushes the time frames out, then it pushes the time frames out. It's a bit like me demolishing my house that I'm living in currently, having no idea where I'm going to live, what I'm going to do um, until I actually get the building consent for the new house that I haven't even got designed yet or my wife hasn't approved. And has there any tenders gone out for the demolishment yet? No. So if I'm in comments, um, the whole issue with the, the reason the timeline has been brought forward for the demolition and um, of the hall is number one to cater for um, asbestos removal, but the bigger picture is the fact that we don't know what the land status is underneath the hall. And We've had a couple of test pits dug all around the property, including even on to the town and country's um, property. It's identified, the trying to test have identified that it's not such a bad state, but it's also not giving us a full picture of what we're dealing with. So when you get these designers putting a hall up um, or designing a hall, which takes quite a bit of money and resources, um, and we don't know what the status of the land is, that could all be, um, Challenged once the hall comes down, and let's say for argument's sake, we are looking at a um, substantial cabin underneath um, that location. It might be more feasible to then, um, where well, you would have to look at maybe moving the hall and the whole and uh, readjusting the concept, which might be going back to a redesign. Whereas if you take the hall down, I mean, we all know we're going to be building a new hall, and um, that's what the community's asked for. But if you take the existing hall down, um, then you can get the status of the land, and then you can design it accordingly.
Is there further comment or discussion on that or thinking yeah. now that you've the had only, that reply? Yeah. The only thing I'll add to that is that um, I'm not a geotechnical expert and you are right, there are some unknowns about what's under that hall. But one thing I do know is that 25 years ago, someone went and um, did a whole lot of work to um, uh, create a lake and that resulted in a lot of issues in Melmore Terrace for a lot of dwellings um, that had to be rectified and monitored. And the logic would say at the moment that if there was some unsatisfactory ground under that hall, that would have manifested itself well and truly by now. The reality, however, is even if that's not the case and it hasn't manifested itself, um, it's it's not going to add, in my view, significantly to a time frame for a multi-million dollar project that is going to be the end of the world. What it does mean, though, is that for a period of time, at least I'm going to say at least six months, if not more, until we dot I's and cross T's, this community has no hall and no plans for a new one. I don't see there is any need to be um, approving the recommendations we've got in front of us today. Can I add to that, please, Chair? And, and I speak in, in the full knowledge that I sit as one of the members of the advisory group. I agree completely with Neil's comments and his view. Um, I think this timetable is it's quite wrong. Until we as an advisory group have a project design or indeed project design options and some idea of the costings, in my view, there is no way we should be looking at closing the hall and then demolishing it. Thank you, Nigel. Anybody else? So, um, Gareth, have you got a? Has there been a tender to go out that you want to start a contractor to start demolishing that hall on the twenty second of May? So, there's tenders gone out for that. Have you got that sorted or what? No, I, we haven't put a tender out. We we need to do a board's approval to move move forward with this. Okay, so what does it? Yeah, so. There's some anxiety around the room about the fact that if we approve the demolition of the hall before we have any idea of what a new hall might look like, that we could be sitting on an empty section and no hall for the community to use. It might it's not necessarily something that's going to speed up or slow down the process. So from Gareth, from your reply that you've given us at this point, I'm hearing from around the um, group that they're not convinced that knocking the hall down serves to speed up the process for the design team and that it may um, in fact just put us in a situation where we've knocked a hall down far too early and still have nothing to even take back to our community to show them. So, sorry, you're, sorry, you're, I mean, just sorry so. Quick comment on that. Um, the whole reason we've done this um, design and construction process the way we've done it is to adhere to um, the LTP and the way it was financed. So, we've got funding from the next financial year, which is July 1, to pr proceed with the construction of this project. So, effectively, the only thing that changes in this is if we delay it, we just have to push the funding in it. So, I mean, we still remain in that financial year until July, until um, June 30, the following year. Um, so does it really push the funding out? Yeah, it would. So if you, um, if you, if we're going to wait for concept plans to be done, and honestly, there's a, there's a workshop that we're going to be planning to bring to the board regardless of the next scoping of the whole um, project. Yeah. But once that's agreed, and then we wait for concept plans, um, and then once that's agreed with the board, we then start this whole process again. We could probably breach um, the funding, which is it's fine. I mean, if that's the board's desire, we'll work within those means. We'll just push the budget from 
next financial year into the following financial year. Um, Madam Chair, can I just come back on something there? Yeah. Um, I I made some notes prior to this meeting and I entirely agree with Neil. I'd actually made a note there that, you know, we were planning to demolish the hall before we had any idea of what we were going to be getting for um, um, you know, for a replacement. But there's also something else that concerns me, and that is that if you look at table one um, on page 50, it says at the bottom of phase one, approved detailed design by the CCB, the community board. If you look at table two, there's no option in there for the community board to approve the design. Um, it also says if you turn over the page or go to the next page, page 52 in table three, it says approved tender process for early engagement of construction partner. I'm not really sure how you can do that when you're still not going to get the, the detailed design available until November. OK, so it does say concept design expected May 2022 and CCB approval required. For the concept design in May 2022 on table two. But that. So. You are expecting a preliminary design within the next couple of months. Is that what I'm? That's what the table suggests. Correct. Yeah, that's a preliminary design, but um, the table one actually says approve a, de a detailed design. Mm -hmm. And further, what Bob's saying that would mean we as a board would have to approve the concept plan, and then say to the, your group that you and Nigel on you get to approve the detailed design. I'd be surprised if we were to do that and put that on you two. That doesn't seem quite fair. So the detailed design is based on the concept. And if there were any major changes to that concept design, we'd obviously have to come back to the board. Uh, so my question then is, why does it say approve the detailed design by the community board in the table one, but not in table two? Am I barking up the wrong tree here? No. No, it does say that in table one. Approved detailed design CCB, so adopt detailed concept plan. Engage with agencies, appoint construction partner and then approve detailed design as, as there in table one. Yeah, apologies. Yes, that was originally um, when we did the, the high level overview of what it would look like. But since then, with engaging with the architects, we've had to um, streamline our process, which is represented in table two and three. I suppose the concern there is, um, Gareth, that in streamlining the process, um, taking out the decision making from the community board is, um, is an issue. Um, That's exactly what I'm concerned yeah. about. And I think also the other issue is that doesn't reflect that the, the process has been streamlined. That doesn't reflect that the resolutions that the board previously made. OK, so we need a way to move forward. Um, and. What I'm hearing is that the board are not comfortable with approving the demolition of the hall until they've seen at least a concept design. Would that be right? Yep. And I, I would just about go further and say we need some kind of budget, budget estimates. Okay. Cheryl, I haven't heard from you on this item yet. I'm in full agreement with um, Neil, Bob, Nigel, I actually think that until you know what you're actually um, or the possibility of what you're going to have, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to actually demolish the hall. Um, I think that I feel like the board is being kind of 
excluded in some way from okay. the decision making at this stage. And I think it would be really wise to have a um, um, the workshop and um, uh, and know what we're actually going to be voting on. Because quite frankly, at the moment, I'm blind. I don't know what's going on. So we're not hearing back from the advisory group. We're not hearing back, um, we're, but we're being asked to close the hall and demolish it. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, the, there's always been talk of the demolition happening um, with a July, August time frame around the demolition. I suppose at the phase we're at now, I suspect that we all maybe had a slightly Pollyanna view that we would have had um, something to look at, think about, discuss in terms of a concept before we got to the point that we that the the hall was going to be demolished. And it looks like we will have a concept before the demolition date, but um, but according to preliminary design work before the demolition date. So I suppose it's it's a matter of whether we're still comfortable knowing that we'll have concept design and preliminary design before we get to that demolition date to say yes go ahead or whether we want to see those things before that happens yeah i mean then what does happen if the land if it's, it's going to take a huge amount of um of work to make it feasible to build it there what, what i'm saying is that we uh, are seeing a concept, well, according to table two, we're going to see a uh, concept design in May. Well, I, that's still before July, that's still time. It would be good to actually see the concept design first before making this decision, I think. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. And I, and I would say again, we need some kind of financials around any concept project plans. Otherwise, we're just firing blind. blind. Mm. Um, Louise has asked to comment. So yes, please, Louise. Um, I just wanted to say that it has never ever been the intention to exclude the community board from any of this. Um, the structure is set up to get um, absolute engagement with the community board and balance off that time thing. I apologise if you don't feel that that is happening and we will work harder on that. If you need us to bring this back to you with the concept design, we can do that. Um, that's, we'll just, we'll, as Gareth just said to me, we'll make it work. Okay, so. We're back to the same sort of resolution that we were looking at for the previous item, I believe, where we are leaving this to lie on the table until the community board, until the 9th of um, May um, meeting um, so that the board can consider the um, concept plan prior to the closure of the hall and demolition date set. Um, Madam Chair, there's also a suggestion that there might be a, a workshop prior to that 9th of May meeting. Correct. Yes, and I, I mean it may still be on that same date. If there's a workshop, we may be meeting earlier in the day to to so that we fully understand what's been going on. Um, um, okay. But I, I, we, I mean, it, or it may be a different day, but quite often a, a workshop on this type of item would be held in the morning on that same day so that we've got the background information that we need. Would that be fair to say, Louise and, and Gareth? Yeah. So, I mean, we well, can think, chat. Think, that, Madam Chair, the other thing to note too is that this isn't a criticism of what the staff have done oh, and where no, they're going. Not. Totally get what they're trying to do and run through a process. And, I, I, and you know, Louise, I don't think there's anything to apologise for here. It's just about, from us, our point of view, making sure that that, that we're doing the right thing in the bigger picture as well. And um, the efforts of the staff to try and move this project on, I, I um, have to acknowledge that they're, they're doing a sterling job and I'm sure they're not going to give up. But just don't take the, the comments that I have, or dare I say, I can't speak to the other board members, what they've said, 
as being a criticism of, of what the staff are doing. It's just that, that, that the concerns that we've got um, that um, need to line up with, um, with with the work that the staff are doing. So I think we can keep on working together and um, I don't think there's any need for any apologies, Louise. No, I, I think I believe that the staff are doing uh, are really working hard behind the scenes to get this project to um, to deliver on on what the community has been waiting for for a long period of time and to do it um, as enthusiastically and as quickly as possible. And I suppose from our perspective of the amount of money that's being spent and what what the project means for the town is just ensuring that we as a community board as elected members have enough information to do our due diligence to know that we're making the right decisions as we move along the process. Um, and, and could I just add, Chia, I don't want to divert the discussion away from the hall, yeah. but in the LTP there's a loan of funding for six million dollars for a new museum to be built on, on the, the same site as the hall and at the moment certainly in the workshop that you and I sit on on behalf of the community board there's been talk of a, of a museum building of 750 square meters now the, the museum sector is a changing dynamic in terms of council policy and also changes of policy within the, the community board in regards to the mall but I can tell you on on any rough figures I've heard of from at workshops if we're talking about a building of 750 square meters we're not talking about six million dollars we're talking about significantly more and it just adds weight to the argument that we need project designs and concept designs and we need to deal with the issue of the museum because um well there's well it's it might be an ideal situation to build two buildings at once there's the option to to decouple the two builds and do them separately and that may incur costs or extra costs or it may not but that issue has, has got to be put on the table alongside what we've been talking about today in terms of the timetable so what you're talking about there is is having that consideration of the different options that may exist for how the museum is incorporated yes. into the project whether it is a museum that is within the hall space a museum that is outside of the hall space but built at the same time in the same location or a museum that is um, built at a later date and potentially in a different location correct okay um louise you had a comment um yeah just a couple of final comments um if we are not getting the right level of information back to the community board i think we need to reassess how the project advisory group is operating and we can have a conversation around that um, at our meetings and the other comment is there is a note in the report that we have a workshop to finalize scope so that will cover off all of your comments nigel that's about um, what's included how big it is what the costs are that's when we have that discussion great thank you all right so we need a resolution um and wayne are you ready for us uh, um, yes yeah <laughs> perfect <laughs> so um, i think the, the resolution is that um the report um will lie on the table until um the 9th of may so that the community board have the opportunity to consider um concept plans prior to making a decision Does that work? Uh, I just missed one word there. Okay. Um, agrees to leave the item to lie on the table until 9 May, so the board has the opportunity to, I uh, missed what the word that was there. Consider. To consider. Yeah. Consider uh, the concept plans prior to a decision. And I would like to add the words and, and financial estimates. Are people, others in agreement with that, that the financials need to be attached to that? I need the estimate costs. Pardon? Sorry, we were just having a discussion about whether that's actually feasible. Um, yeah. I, I would rather if you 
that we could bring this back to you in May with the concept plans. It's left lying on the table. And if you feel a need for financial detail, we'll bring what we can. You can yeah. um, raise that matter then. Yeah, I yeah, I am wondering, Nigel, if that's not enough time to have um, to have really good figures around it, but just some general idea of some financials. Yeah, because the problem is, unless we've got some idea of financials, we've got no context with, with the, within which to evaluate the concept design. So yeah, and I think that Louise and Gareth both did say that the workshop would include that information in it. Yes, yeah, so the workshops around the scope, um, yeah. and um, and that's when we'll have that discussion. But I don't think we're going to have financials by May. Um, yeah, I think we need to have that conversation then, um, mm -hmm. then consider that at that point. That to me would mean if there's not enough financial information in May, it'd be pretty hard for the board to approve a concept with no idea of the dollars involved. It's it's okay. approving the scope. Okay. Okay. So, and on the um, on table two, it says that that will be concept design with CCB approval required. But you're saying the workshop would be looking at concept design and the scope of the project at that point. So, so the workshop is the scope. Um, and then the concept design will be presented in, in May's. Um, we, we're not too sure what the date of the workshop is going to be. We're working with governance um, to establish that date. Yeah. But it's definitely the concept design will be floated in May. Okay. So I need some direction then. Are we including the, the words and financial estimates into that resolution or not? But it helps, I'd, I'd say high level financials. I, I understand the difficulty in, in getting too specific. But unless we've got something, we're hamstrung. So how, how by that time, how possible is it to have some high level figures available for the workshop? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Louise has um, indicated that high level financials can um, can be done by then. And Darren, yes, you can comment. Hello, everyone. Uh, Darren here. Um, yes, so I've been speaking to Jazz Max in the background. Um, they are working on figures now for a rough square meterage rate as we currently speak for the 2000 square meters and they plan to have them for when we carry out the, um, the workshop next. Um, they're hoping to achieve that workshop around uh, some point in early April as soon as possible. So we're just trying to get everything, all the evidence together so we can bring as much as possible to you. And then in May, that's when when they go away from there, they'll take all of these ideas that we get from that workshop, create um, some concept plans and come back with figures for the each concept plans. So that's where they're currently suggesting is the path that we're going at the moment. OK, thank you, Darren. Ma Madam Chair, great to hear, but early April is um, next week. Um, my calendar's screwed and then it's Easter, so we might have to do some jiggery poker to try and get some time to do this. So Darren, were you talking about a workshop for the whole board or were you talking about a workshop for the advisory group again when you're talking early April? We're talking about trying to get the board together, board together. Um, so yeah. that's why we're just we're just trying to see what, when they'll have all the information as best possible ready. And then we'll be obviously looking at people's calendars and seeing when the best feasibility for getting everyone in the same room is to talk about this. Yeah, same room stuff still quite hard at this. Um, well, I, I see room. for somebody who's stuck at home. <laughs> yeah, or a digital room, an online room. Um, OK. So we're back to that resolution. So Wayne, can you read me what we've got at the moment? OK. Agrees to leave the item to lie on the table until 9 May, so the board has the opportunity to consider the concept plans prior to a decision or could have and high level financial estimates. 
I don't think we arrived. I'm not sure you arrived at uh, whether you wanted you to. Do you want to include the wording high level financial estimates, estimates in the resolution? I think we should. OK, Cheryl and Nigel, I know think we should. Neil? Yeah, sorry, mute button found. Yep, don't disagree. OK, back. Right, and the expedience of people not being able to find their mute buttons, I think there's enough people there who feel that that should be included for us to include it. So, Wayne, can you read it back to me and we'll figure out where to put those words in? Uh, agrees to leave the item uh, to lie on the table until 9 May, so the board has the opportunity to consider the concept plans prior to a decision and high level financial estimates. Can we put the high level financial, financial estimates, estimates after concept plans? Consider after the concept, concept plans and high level financial estimates, estimates prior, to, prior to a decision. Yep, OK. Sounds Can you read me back to me one, one more time? Yeah. Agrees to leave the uh, item to lie on the table until 9 May, so the board has the opportunity to consider the concept plans and high level financial estimates prior to a decision. Great. Do I have somebody who's prepared to move and second that um, resolution, please? Move that. Bob? And a seconder? Sure. Um, Buck, thank you. All in favour? Aye. 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 And I do actually want to acknowledge um, Darren and Gareth that this is a monumental task to try and get this in the timeframes that you're talking about and over the line and decisions made. And, and we know that we've just put another layer of pressure on that. But I also know that the board's done it for a reason. And that reason is to be sure that we actually can deliver the type of project within the time, well, actually within the cost framework that we're actually we're going to be able to, to do that with and not make decisions that might be putting the, um, the cart before the horse. So I appreciate that this probably was um, not how you wanted this to go. We're all still, I know, fully committed to this project and getting it over the line. We just want to be sure that we're doing it um, in the best way. So thank you for your time. Right, thank you, um, Gareth and Louise. Um, and um, I know we'll, we'll look forward to that update and knowing when we might be able to fit in that next um, workshop um, meeting to look at what's coming next for us. Our next item is on page 61 of your agenda 22.2.6 and is the Cromwell Financial Report for the period ending the 31st of December 2021. Welcome Donna. Thank you. Um, so through the chair, I take the paper as being read. Um, the financial report for the period ending the 31st of December 2021 shows a favourable variance of $140,000 um, against the revised budget. So the operating income has an unfavourable variance of $85,000. Um, this continues to be due to um, lower than expected interest revenue. Um, this results from low interest rates and also property purchases um, from last financial year that have been included in our long-term plan. Um, the operating expenditure is favourable with a variance of $225,000. Um, this is mainly due to the timing of operational activities such as seasonal staff requirements and maintenance programs. Um, you'll notice a comment also about the depreciation. So while at the moment it is favourable, um, it's being offset by um, parks assets which have a lower than expected depreciation cost against them and that is um, offsetting the Cromwell pool depreciation which is higher than budget. So um, in previous years the council elected to phase in the rating of that depreciation for the pools um, due to a significant increase in the revaluation back in June 2020. Um, capital expenditure 
um, has a favourable variance of 3.3 .3 million, with 4% of the total revised budget being spent. Um, so large projects are still working through design and investigation phases, including the Cromwell Memorial Hall and the town centre upgrades. Um, we also have the full heat pump replacement project. Um, so we're waiting for the delivery of the heat pump before the installation can start in April. Um, and parks and reserves work programs are beginning to ramp up again in March. Um, are there any questions? I can't put my hand up, Madam Chair, and I hate doing this. Um, the question, I've got a question about the depreciation on the pool. And it, I'm sorry if I missed your explanation you were talking about it, but I didn't quite get it all. Um, the depreciation is unfavourable and is higher than what we expected. What's driven that? Is that the, that's the revaluation, is it? Or is it something else that I'm missing? Yes, yeah, so um, for the um, pool depreciation, it is quite higher, a lot higher than budget. Um, so back in 2020, which unfortunately is before my time um, here, the um, pool was revalued quite significantly. And I don't have those figures on the top of my head, I'm sorry, um, which meant that depreciation would have increased the rates by a significant amount um, at that time. So it was decided that um, it would be phased in over three years, I believe. Um, as a way of reducing the impact to the ratepayers. Yeah, thank you. I've got a question, Madam Chair, but I can't figure out where my hand has gone to put up. You can't use your hand in a live meeting. Ah, that explains <laughs> so You have to put it in the chat instead. <laughs> Good to know, thank you. And explained with the kindness of a school teacher to a silly boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Donna, I just want to go back to your comment of the um, the interest revenue being unfavourable and Sanchi can attest I beat my personal best record for asking stupid questions and I did that before lunchtime today so I might be about to add to that record but it says in part that it's due to low market interest rates mm -hmm. but I would have thought that the interest rates now are higher than what they would have been when the budget was put in place. So we either, the only way I can see is that we estimated that the interest rates would be higher than they actually are, or have I missed something glaringly obvious? Because I don't see how we wouldn't be in a better position with interest rates having gone up. Yeah, so a lot of um, the budget planning for the long-term plan process is done in advance of the actual market. Um, so a lot of these figures have been driven from the information that was gathered for the long-term plan process, um, which unfortunately I was not here for um, either, so I was not um, able to look at that information. Um, so that is one of the factors, is that it was actually geared to remain relatively stable, whereas the Reserve Bank had taken dramatic um, changes during COVID to decrease interest rates. And as a result, it's also taking a while for them to pick back up again. So um, that is one reason. So there, there was a dip, but I'm, I'm looking at it going from here to here, but I've forgotten about this bit down here. Purely yep. unscientific, but that makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. Anyone else with questions um, for Donna? Not yours, Donna. Sorry, Madam Chair. That's OK. Anyone else with questions for Donna? OK, um, thank you, Donna. And the recommendation that we have is that the report be received. So do I have a mover and a seconder, please? Thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your mic coming on. <laughs> and a seconder. My mic's come on as well. Thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate that. All in favour? Aye. Aye. And against? Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Donna. And welcome, Mayor Tim.
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Kia ora, board members. Um, it, it's nice to see you, albeit uh, virtually, and looking forward to hopefully um, in six weeks' time we might all be together again. Since we last met on um, February 15th, basically February was in the early parts of March was um, very hectic for me with the work on the governance working group, um, the Three Waters governance working group. So that did keep me um, really well exercised till the end of uh, sort of. First week into March, we put our report to the minister, still waiting to see how many of the 47 recommendations um, she and the government will pick up. Um, we had a lot of events that I would normally attend around the region on the flip side have been cancelled or postponed due to COVID. So there's been a bit less going out, a lot more of this stuff, which um, we're all getting used to, but when you have a whole day of it, it does get quite tiring. It was significantly saddened to see the entirely appropriate cancellation of the Naitahu Waitangi Day commemorations that we were going to hold in central Otago for the first time this year. We'll be waiting another three years now before our opportunity again. Look, it was a, the right thing to cancel, but it doesn't blunt the sharpness of the loss. I hope everybody um, has had a chance, and if they haven't, I really commend that you do to watch Wahi Tu Puna presented by Kamatoa Edward Allison. Um, it was online in Waitangi Day in lieu of the local commemorations and it presented highlights of um, Central Otago landmarks and traditional stories that are such an important part of our local Kaitahu history, culture and traditions. And sorry, that's my phone. Our pre-European history is too often overlooked and ignored. Uh, and I found this fascination, uh, this uh, presentation utterly fascinating. Um, I attended the Cromwell Business Breakfast in February. Uh, there was a representative of Central Otago International Airport there and he spoke to a large and engaged audience. I, uh, the opposite end of the scale attended a think drinks hosted by Misha's Vineyard or winery. It was one of the first occasions I think the true effect of Omicron was felt um, because I went to that and I was half of the live audience. There were two of us there. A significant number of folk came online but um, people just didn't turn up, um, which is unusual for think drinks. It's very popular. I also attended the Business South February meeting that was at the gate and following that had a meeting with members of the Tongan community of Cromwell in relation to supporting their effort to gather food and goods to send to the island group following the volcanic eruption. They've had great support from the local Lions clubs and hopefully we'll see a good outcome. There was details in last week's CR news about how to help. And I also had the privilege of opening the Eden Hall Central Otago photographic exhibition at McNulty House. I didn't make the McNulty House opening uh, last year, about a year ago now due to surgery. So um, they've been to a meeting in the main room. I hadn't seen the whole restoration. It was a great way to see it. Um, the, the Eden Hawk photographs really fitted beautifully well into that space. And I just think it's, uh, it's a great asset to Cromwell McNulty House and the exhibition I understand is very well attended. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, that's me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Do I have a mover and a seconder for Tim's report, please? Or any questions that you wish to ask prior to that? I'll second your motion, um, Madam Chair. Yeah, perfect. All in favour? Aye. Thank Aye. you. OK, and then it's on to my report, and I don't have a great deal to report. Um, the management of the Omicron outbreak from a school principal perspective has been um, the thing that's taken up most of my time and energy over the last little while and ensuring that there's clear, calm communication to my community about exactly what's happening um, and and how it's how we're managing and how we're organizing um, for learning for children who may not be able to be at school and um, while we have um, some issues with staffing. So I'm sure I'm not alone out there in the world of people running organisations um, in terms of um, having to manage all of those different things. Um, I have pulled back from um, most of my face-to-face -face commitments as a result of that. Um, I figure that my interactions over most days are with more than 300 people, with um, about 30% of them having already had or um, currently have um, COVID-19. So I have felt that it's probably not wise for me to attend um, meetings in small rooms with others. I believe I'm probably a risk to them. So I haven't attended the Museum Trust um, meetings over the, the last 
um, month and I made a decision not to attend the opening of the um, Eden Hoare exhibition um, at McNulty House um, because that was really when things were starting to um, take off in terms of the outbreak within my school community. So I feel like I've been a bit of a hermit who has gone between home and school um, in the last six weeks. Um, I have of course done my um, usual scheduled radio interview with Shane from Radio C Central um, on the 16th of February, so immediately after our meeting. Um, and I have attended an awful lot of Zoom meetings. I'm um, participating in a strategic leadership um, program this year with the Springboard Trust um, and um, I would attest the same as Tim to the how hard it is some days when you're in Zoom meetings for significant portions of, of the day. But I'd have to say that the, the work that the Spring, Springboard Trust do um, in their leadership space has been, um, I've really enjoyed what we've been doing so far. I've also continued to do my fortnightly column for the Cromwell and Districts News over that time. I'm really hoping that once we come back into term two, that the beginning of May means that we are back to engaging face to face and um, and that we're through the peak of this outbreak and um, feel like we're better able to make connections across our community um, once that happens. So that's all I've got to report um, for this meeting. Um, so I'll move my report if somebody could second it, please. I will, Anna. Cheryl Thank you. Um, all in favour? Aye. Thank you. And members reports. Um, and I know that um, you will need to put on your camera for your report. So if I give two people to start with, then if both of you sort of get your camera ready and then we'll queue up the next person after that. So from what I can see on my screen, if we start with Bob and then move to Neil, please. Got my camera on, can you see or? Yes, thank you. Good. I've got very little to report this uh, this month, unfortunately. The number of uh, events that I was due to attend have also been cancelled. But um, on the 2nd of March, um, I attended also the Cromwell Business Group Breakfast. Um, yeah, Tim may have forgotten about this because he was also there. And um, interestingly, he cycled home, I believe, from that meeting in Cromwell. Um, and at that meeting, amongst other things, the Cromwell Promotions Group uh, presented their plans for the extended light up winter event in 2022, uh, which was very interesting and very well received actually by, um, I would imagine something like uh, 35 to 40 other visitors. Um, on the 8th of March, I attended um, a planning meeting with the Cromwell and Districts Promotions Group uh, for their Light Up Winter campaign. Um, and they have actually agreed next month to hold their meeting on the 12th of April um, at the Cromwell Golf Club. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Bob, Neil. And after Neil, we will have um, Cheryl, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, like everybody else, probably not a lot of stuff happening. Um, a hearings panel meeting on the 8th of March. Uh, a couple of items, one for a, um, a new residence and um, cafe up in Pukarangi Drive at Queensbury, and another one for a uh, two lot subdivision in Heaney Road, Lowburn Valley. Um, um, I don't think either of them are public as yet. Um, so the decision is pending. Um, council meeting was on the 9th of March and um, we did hear in the public forum from the um, Central Otago Housing Trust, uh, Glenn Christensen, um, for the report that we considered a bit later on. Um, the Having trouble reading some of my um, notes because I put a hot cup on my writing and it's one of those pens that you can rub out and heat actually does the same thing, funnily enough, so I can't quite read what it says. Um, the safe speed bylaw was approved for consultation and that um, is currently underway and a lot of effort being put into 
get the community to have input into that. Um, the economic development work program report, um, which I think I checked with my wording and um, despite everything we're getting through was probably the best way of putting it. It's certainly not perfect, but it could have been a lot worse, I suspect. Um, the dan dan dangerous and sanitary buildings policy was adopted after no submissions um, from the public notification. Um, um, our submission, no, no, um, emitting, um, emissions trading scheme costs, um, carbon prices have gone stupid was the word I heard. Um, and we're probably lucky we got some forest credits to offset the increase. Um, the simple message about that is if you want to save um, the cost of carbon, stop producing waste um, and that'll, that'll help a lot. Um, we talked briefly about the review of the future of local government um, and then they discussed the agenda item in relation to council's role in affordable housing um, and uh, at this stage there is a policy being um, considered um, and more importantly um, consideration being given to um, and understanding from our community whether they want to put uh, their funds and resources into um, um, affordable housing. Uh, the William Fraser stage six is going. Some extra funds are approved for that um, to upgrade the toilet area. Um, I think the rest I can pretty well leave for Nigel and Cheryl in terms of infrastructure stuff. Um, the other couple of notes I'll make is that um, Central Otago is currently in a restricted fire season. Um, as of today, we are now all permits that maybe um, have been issued, which you have to have in a restricted fire season, have been cancelled and still uh, until the fourth or fifth of April. And here goes the news flash: Southland is now in a prohibited fire season. Who would have thought that Southland would ever be in a prohibited fire season? It's very dry out there, folks. And for anybody out there in the public that's listening, um, this weekend is the end of daylight saving. Please change your smoke detector batteries and also make sure your chimney is clean and ready for its use in winter. That'll be me. Thank you for your public service announcement announcements at the end there, Neil. Much appreciated. We have Cheryl next and after Cheryl, we'll move to Buck, please. Um, OK, so I um, uh, attended the same council meeting, obviously, as Neil and um, one other item that they had an application from um, Climate Solutions Aotearoa. They are wanting to lease the, some land over the where the Cromwell Wastewater Treatment Plant is. Um, they are um, into, uh, into material recovery and environmental waste collection. So it was agreed to give them, to grant them a lease for five years and then with the right of renewal of um, three, three more rights of renewal. Um, what else? Um, of course, you'll all be aware that Cromwell Community House had a fire. Um, so which is it's uh, there was a fire in the alleyway out the back. It's a real shame. They had just completed uh, renovating that room that was recarpeted and repainted. And um, so anyway, that's all cordoned off at the moment and you can't enter the room. It as it's a council building, I'm presuming that you'll be um, insurance and so that that will be renovated um, shortly. At the, I was in there again um, today, this week, and um, it still smells um, and they think it's the, the fire, that the smoke smell is coming down from the vacant space above the building. Um, so hopefully that will. Um, we've also got um, a possible new um, trustee um, that um, is interested in joining Cromwell Community House. Um, and what else? And there was a historic precinct meeting on the 17th of March. However, that was cancelled due to sickness. Um, and then it was rescheduled for the 24th, which I was unable to attend. So that's me. Thank you, Cheryl. Back and then we'll finish with Nigel. Um, so I had a talk from the Terrace community about wanting. They've got a toilet up there just uh, or went to a meeting up there. They had got toilets up there. They like to, or it's really a room with a generator in it that they would like to get rid of that because it's never used and put some more public toilets in up there because everyone uses the um, grounds up there, but they've all got to go down to the um, 
shops to use toilets. They would thought there'd be a better idea than using the old gen the generators never been used. Um, haven't heard anything from the Bannockburn domain, um, otherwise been pretty quiet because of COVID. Thank you, Buck. Um, Nigel. Thank you, Chair. Um, most of what I've got relates to the council meeting on the 9th of March. And it's been touched on by other councillors. I, I would say about the emissions trading um, regime has been uh, because units are sold in an auction system and because every tonne of uh, rubbish we send to Victoria Flats is a calculation that every tonne generates so, so much greenhouse gas emissions and that's what we have to surrender units against. And we, but from memory, we budgeted our year's cost of that tax at around um, $330,000. But because these units are sold on an open auction system and there are a finite number of them, uh, the price has exploded. So I think currently a emissions trading unit is selling at something like $82 a unit. So that considerable cost overruns this year. Next year it's projected to probably be an overrun of three to four hundred thousand dollars depending on where the price is. So that as Neil noted, we we've, we've covered that shortfall in funding by using uh, uh, forestry credits, which which is useful, but that will not go on forever and sooner rather than later we'll be rating ratepayers to pay those emissions trading costs. And I'd also note the, the point that Cheryl made about the lease on waste, Cromwell waste treatment land with a, with a long lease. And we'd just really just like to note that that doesn't set any kind of precedent because it's not comparable to normal leases where, where there could be other uses for that land. There is no other use for that land in the view of the infrastructure team. And so it was and the lessee would only have gone there on the basis of a long lease given the capital expenditure involved. So I think that's a win for the community and the community board, but, but the term, the long term of the lease doesn't set any kind of precedent in my view. And Neil touched also on affordable housing. I believe that's going to have implications for Gear Avenue Stage 2 and delay it further. Um, hang on, Nigel, I'll just hold you back for just a second. Neil would like to add something to that comment about the, the land you were talking about just before. Yeah, yeah. It's OK with you. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry, Madam Chair. I mean, um, after Nigel's finished, I beg your pardon, my apologies. I should have been oh, being chair of the comment. Uh, um, so I think the, I think the resolution the council passed on affordable housing needs to be circulated amongst the community board because it has implications for our timing of Gear Avenue Stage 2. We had a museum workshop again, as was noted, um, and as we've discussed in a previous item, I think that has quite the, the present, um, in my view, lack of direction of, of um, a council-wide museum policy, particularly in, in financials, but in other areas as well, it is potentially negative impact on Cromwell's plans. Um, and finally, I'd like to touch on uh, the future of local government. We discussed that at the council and then um, and I've made some notes and I'll finish with just reading those notes because for me this, this is a, a, a really important topic. So Minister Mahuta has set up a ministerial inquiry into the future of local government and, and that inquiry is in the second of three stages. And the report is due to be finished by April 2023. The committee has issued an interim report called Raising the Platform. And Council had a Zoom meeting with three of the inquiry committee members earlier this month. In the report, and there were lots of questions asked and answered, the report identifies five principles that underpin their thinking. And I'd like to speak, just touch on two of them as an indication of how important this inquiry is going to be. First was the local the first principle that sits there is that local government should have the goal of improving people's social well-being, but also aim for social equity and financial equity. While we are at present required to 
consider well-beings as part of our responsibilities under the Act. The scope of these extra aspirations, whatever they may mean, are very different from our present responsibilities. The second principle that was talked about was, have, was having, and I quote the word, an authentic relationship with Māori, which would include self-determination and shared authority. Again, the words are not defined, but in this case, we know from what is happening at a national level in health and education and three waters, the conversation that the inquiry is likely to have will centre around Maori wards, separate funding and 50-50 shared governance of councils. Our present democratic system that has evolved over the last 150 years where people are nominated to public office and everyone votes for the person of their choice based on one person, one vote, is not discussed in the interim report. There will be plenty of opportunity for people to make submissions to this inquiry, and it is certainly, in my view, worth paying attention to because this report, in my view, is likely to be revolutionary in its impact. And that's my report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Neil, you had a comment that you wished to make. Um, well, no, just a couple of items that I that I had forgotten, and I want to congratulate um, um, Connect Cromwell in the uh, opening of the um, Cromwell Disc Golf. I um, haven't had a chance to go and give it a crack yet. The wing's not working anyway, but um, that's that's pretty cool to see that move ahead. Um, and I, I did see the, um, some publicity about um, some volleyball nets down at Alpha Street, which um, um, was was news to me, which is great. Um, but the, I'm not sure who where it's come from or how, but um, what a good idea. Um, and um, yeah, that was the only things I wanted just to, to note. Thank you. And um, Connect Cromwell have indicated that they are likely to have some sort of more formal opening of um, of those um, in May. Um, I received an email today to say that the, the golf is now up and running and they're going to have an opening of some description in May. So that will be um, something to look forward to then. OK, so um, can I have a mover and a seconder for the um, members' reports, please? Thanks, I'm Cheryl. Second. Um, and that takes us to item 22.2.10, which is on page 69 of your agendas, which is the governance report. Um, and um, there's um, a few um, items included in there, um, which includes the um, statistics package in regard to the Cromwell pool and their KPI update. Um, are there any items that people wish to make comment on or ask questions about or discuss as part of this report? Um, Madam Chair, note that the promotions group under the legacy status reports for the promotion grant funding for FY Mm -hmm. uh, 21 that we're almost 12 months down the track and they haven't furnished their report. I find that really hard to believe and I know the staff are trying their best to get it out, but um, I would have thought that um, with the next low applications due to thing uh, come up, um, I'm surprised we haven't got a report of what happened yeah. 11 months ago. I think, I mean, this is only speculation, but potentially in regard to the um, changes that were made to how grants were handed out and timeframes. I don't know, but I, I agree with you. We, it's probably something that we should have seen by now. Um, anybody else with comment or questions around our governance reports? OK, so that takes us to the recommendation on page 69 which is that the report be received. Can I have a mover and a seconder? I'll move. Thank you. I'll second, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, all in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. Aye. And that takes us to the date of our next scheduled meeting, which is the 9th of May, and then to the resolution to exclude the public. So um, the public 
be excluded from the following parts of the proceeding of this meeting. The general subject matter of each matter to be considered while the public is excluded. The reason for passing this resolution in relation to each matter and the specific grounds are written there 